Welcome back to College Physics 2. We're continuing our tour in some more interesting concepts in physics. And we're going through this section on electricity and magnetism. We've covered several chapters so far. We did an overview of electric forces and fields. We talked about capacitance and capacitors. We talked about resistors and, and current. Um, we, then we talked about direct current circuits, DC circuits. And the next topic we're going to get into is magnetism. And so what we're showing here in this figure, you'll see it again later in our lecture here, is the interior view of the closed tom tomahawk um, fusion test reactor vacuum vessel at the Pro um, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. And so um, interesting device there. So before we get into the, the details of today's lecture, we'll do a little bit of a reading review. And so these are reading questions. I will go through these fairly quickly and you can feel free to pause the, the lecture and review each one as we go. So number one, a particle of charge Q travels with velocity V in the same direction as the magnetic field B. What is a force exerted on the charge? And the answer to this first one is, the, is zero. Second question, a particle of positive charge Q travels with velocity V towards the top of the screen. The magnetic field present B points rightward. The force, the answer is points into the screen. Two parallel wires carry currents in the same direction and exert a force on each of magnitude F for each meter of length. One of the currents is now reversed in direction doubled in magnitude. What are the result? What are the resulting magnitude for the forces per meter of length and its direction relative to the wires? And the answer is 2F repulsive. A charged particle is moving perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field. The radius of its path can be decreased most by, and the answer is, so the choices given here are decreasing its velocity, increasing the magnitude of the magnetic field. Now, suppose a long straight wire carries a current upwards, a short distance directly east of the wire, a negatively charged particle is moving upward parallel to the wire. In what direction is the magnetic force on the particle? The answer is the force is eastward. So just a, a few questions um, reading the chapter before you come to this lecture. This will be a little bit of a reminder, so you might want to just go ahead and look over the material in the textbook, um, both before and after you, you see this material. So magnets are fascinating and are also very used to, useful. Electromagnetics are used to pick up heavy loads, magnets are used in meters, motors, and loudspeakers. Magnetic tapes and discs are used in the sound and video recording equipment and to store computer data. Intense magnetic fields are used in magnetic resonant imaging or MRI devices used to explore the human body. And the list goes on. Magnetism is linked to electricity. Um, this we get into the whole area of electromagnetic theory. Magnetic fields affect moving charges and moving charges produce magnetic fields. <clears throat> um, changing magnetic fields can even create electric fields. In this topic, we will explore magnetism and, and its relationship to electricity, electric current, sorry. So here we're showing an illustration of a horseshoe magnet with um, iron fillings on the end. And so you probably played with some type of magnet um, somewhere along the line. And so an example would be a horseshoe magnet, like the one here that can pick up iron containing objects like paper clips and, and nails. Here's a, a bar magnet. And for our discussion, we'll focus on bar shaped magnets. Iron objects are strongly attracted to either end of the of a bar magnet. The ends are called as poles. One is called a North Pole and the other is the South Pole. You might wonder where these names come from. Imagine a bar magnet 
suspended from its midpoint by a piece of string so it can swing freely in a horizontal plane. The magnet will rotate until its north pole points to the north and its south pole points to the south. The same idea is used to construct a simple compass. Magnetic poles exert attractive or repulsive forces on each other, which is similar to the electrical forces between charged objects. In fact, simple experiments with two bar magnets show that like poles repel each other and unlike poles attract each other. There's one very important difference between electrical forces between charged particles and the behavior of magnetic poles. Positive and negative electric charges can exist in isolation of each other. North and south poles do not. No matter how many times a permanent magnet is cut, each piece always has a north pole and a south pole. There is some um, theoretical basis that magnetic, magnetic mon monopoles um, exist in nature, and the attempt to detect them is currently an active ex experimental field and in investigation. So here's um, a picture of um, magne magnetite. Um, and it, if you stroke an unmagnetized piece of iron with a magnet, you can magnetize it in iron. If a piece of unmagnetized iron is placed near a strong permanent magnet, the piece of iron eventually becomes magnetized and you can accelerate the, the process by heating and then cooling the iron. Naturally occurring magnet, magnetic materials, for example, magnetite, as shown in the, the photo here, are magnetized in, in this way because they have been subject to Earth's magnetic field for a long periods of time. Soft magnetic materials such as iron are easy to are easily magnetized, um, but tend to lose their magnet magnetization easily. These materials are used in the core of transformers, generators, and motors. Iron is a, a most common choice because it's inexpensive. Other Magnetically soft materials include nickel, nickel iron alloys, and ferrites. Ferrites are a combination of uh, um, divalent metal oxides of nickel or ma magnesium with ferric oxide. Ferrites are used in high frequency applications such as radar. Hard magnetic materials are used in permanent magnet. These magnets provide magnetic fields without the use of electricity. Permanent magnets are, are used in many devices, including loudspeakers, speakers, permanent magnet motors, and read and write heads of computer hard drives. There are a large number of different materials used in permanent magnets. Uh, Alnico is a generic name for various alloys of iron, cobalt, and nickel, together with smaller amounts of aluminum, copper, or other elements. Rare earths, such as um, Several set rare earths are also used in conjunction with other elements to make strong permanent magnets. So here in the figure, we're um, in A, we're sh um, showing the tracing the magnetic field of a bar magnetic with compasses. And in B, we have we're showing several magnetic field lines of a bar magnet. As you may recall, an electric field sur surrounds any stationary electric charge. The region of space surrounding a moving charge includes a magnetic field. The magnetic field also surrounds a prop properly magnetized magnetic object. In order to describe any type of field, vector field, we must define its magnitude or strength and its direction. The direction of a magnetic field B at any location is the direction in which the north pole of a compass needle points at that location. And so we're seeing in the figure on the left how the magnetic field of a bar magnet can be traced with the aid of a compass defining a magnetic field line. So in the figure on the right, a couple of magnetic field lines are traced out. And of course, here the, the field lines are shown in, in two dimensions. In reality, they exist in three dimensions. So in this figure, um, the, the magnetic field pattern of a bar of magnet is displayed with iron fillings on a sheet of paper. That's what we're seeing in A. And in B, we're seeing the magnetic field patterns between unlike poles of two bar magnets as displayed with iron fillings. And then in, finally in C, we're seeing the magnetic field pattern between two like poles. 
We can see the pattern produced by magnetic fields by placing small iron filings in the vicinity of a magnet, as we're seeing in the figure. And so, as we said, the, the left-hand figure is for a single bar magnet. The, the middle bar is for two magnets with unlike poles, and the right is for an interaction of like poles. Forensic scientists use a technique similar to this, just shown in the figure, to, to find fingerprints at a cream so, um, crime sign, crime scene. Sorry. And one way to find latent or invisible prints is by sprinkling a powder um, of dust iron on a surface. The iron adheres to any perspiration or body oils that are present and can be um, spread around on the surface with a magnetic brush that will never come in contact with the powder or the surface. Now we're showing a illustration here of the Earth's magnetic field lines, the lines leading away from the immediate vicinity of the North Magnetic Pole and entering the vicinity of the South Magnetic Pole have been left out for clarity. We say a bar magnet has North and South Poles, but it's more accurate to say it has a North Seeking Pole and a South Seeking Pole. In other words, if a bar magnet is used as a compass, one end will seek or point to the geographic north pole of Earth, and the other will seek or point to the geographic south pole of Earth. For this, we can conclude that the geographic north pole of Earth corresponds to a magnetic south pole, and the geographic south pole of Earth corresponds to the magnetic north pole. In fact, the configuration Earth's magnetic field pictured here resembles that what we could observe if a huge bar magnet were buried deep in the Earth's interior. So here we're seeing a map of the continental United States showing the, the, the declination of a compass from true north. Um, if a compass needle is allowed to rotate in the vertical and horizontal planes, a needle is horizontal with respect to Earth's surface only near the equator. Further north, the needle rotates so it's, it's points more and more towards the surface of Earth. The angle between the direction of the magnetic field and the horizontal is called the, the dip angle. At a point just north of Hudson Bay in Canada, the, the, the north pole of the needle points directly downward with a dip angle of 90 degrees. That site, found, first found in 1832, is considered to be the location of the South Magnetic Pole of Earth. It is approximately 1,300 miles from Earth's geographic North Pole and varies with time. Earth's Magnetic North Pole is, is about 1,200 miles from its geographic South Pole. This means that the compass needles points only approximately north. The difference between the true north defined as the geographic north pole and the north indicated by the compass varies from place to place. This difference is referred to as a ma magnetic declination. For example, a long a line through South Carolina and the Great Lakes, a compass indicates true north, whereas in Washington state, it, it aligns 25% east of true north, as we can see in the figure. Now we're getting a chance to look at the um, Earth's interior and then focusing on the core. The, the source of Earth's magnetic field can't consist um, of large magnets of per permanently magnetized material. Earth does not have large deposits of, of iron ore deep beneath its surface, but the high temperature in the core prevent the iron from retaining any permanent mag magnet magnetization. It's more likely that the true source of Earth's magnetic field is electric current in the liquid part of its core. The current, which is not well understood, may be driven by an interaction between the planet's rotation and convection in the hot liquid core. There is some evidence that the strength of the planet's magnetic field is related to the planet's rate of rotation. For example, Jupiter rotates faster than Earth, and, and recent space probes indicate that Jupiter's magnetic field is stronger than Earth's, even though Jupiter lacks an iron core. Venus, on the other hand, rotates more slowly than Earth, and its magnetic field is weaker. Scientists are continuing to investigate the cause of Earth's magnetism. The direction of the Earth's magnetic field reverses every few million years. The evidence for this phenomenon is from an iron containing rock basalt, which is sometimes spewed forth by volcanic activity on the ocean floor. As the lava cools, it solidifies and retains a picture of the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. 
when the basalt deposits are dated, they prove evidence for periodic reversals of the magnetic field. The cause of these field reversals is not, still not well understood. So a couple items to be thinking about. Um, in the here, we have a figure of a meteorite from Mars, possibly a fossils of ancient Mar Martian bacterial life. That's what we have as a hypothesis. Scientists um, speculate that some animals, such as birds, use the magnetic field of Earth to guide their, their migrations. Um, I'm going to go back to this one chart here. So I know that they talked about basalt and the age of the Earth. There are some that would not agree that the age of the Earth is old. And so this is uh, one hypothesis that typically modern science would, would promote, but not necessarily what everyone would hold to. Um, so back to, to this chart. Um, studies have shown that a type of um, anaerobic bacterium that lives in swamps has a magnetized chain of magnites as part of the its inner internal structure. The mag magneti magnetized chain acts as a compass needle that is, enables the bacteria to align with Earth's magnetic field. When they find themselves out of the mud on the bottom of the swamp, they return to their oxygen-free environments by following the magnetic field lines of Earth. Interestingly, bacteria found in the northern hemisphere have internal mag mag magnetite chains that are opposite in polarity to those of similar bacteria in the southern hemisphere. 2001, a meteorite originated on Mars has been found to, to contain a chain of magnite. Um, NASA scientists believe it may be a fossil of ancient Martian bacterial life. As we mentioned shortly when we first introduced the figure. Here we're showing a, a airport runway. The magnetic field of Earth is also used to label runways at airport airports according to their direction. A large number is painted on the end of the runway so it can be read by the pilot of an incoming aircraft. The number describes the direction in which the airplane is traveling, expressed as a magnetic heading in degrees measured clockwise from magnetic north divided by 10. A runway marked nine would be directed towards the east, 90 degrees divided by 10 whereas a, a runway marked 18 would be directed towards magnetic south. Experiments show that a stationary charged particle doesn't interact with a static magnetic field. When a charged particle is moving through a magnetic field, however, a magnetic force acts on it. The force has its maximum value when the charge moves in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field lines and decreases to zero as a particle moves along the field lines. This is quite different from the electric force, which exerts a force on a charged particle, whether it's moving it or at rest. Remember too, that the electric force is directly parallel to the electric field. The magnetic force on a moving charge, on the other hand, is directly perpendicular to the magnetic field. In our discussion of electricity, the electric field at some point in space was defined as the electric force per unit charge acting on some test charge placed at that point. In a similar way, we can describe the properties of the magnetic field E at some point in terms of the magnetic force exerted on a test charge at that point. Our test optic is a charge Q moving with velocity V. It is found experimentally that the, the strength of the magnetic force on the particle is proportional to the magnitude of the charge Q, the magnitude of the velocity V, the strength of the external magnetic field B, and the sine of the angle theta between the direction of V and the direction of B. These are observations can be summarized by writing the magnitude of the magnetic force as shown here. We can then define the magnitude of the magnetic field. Um, if one Coulomb charge moves in the direction perpendicular to a magnetic field of one um, T with a speed of one meter per second. The, ma the magnetic force exerted on the charge is one Newton. We can express the units of V as shown here. In practice, we often use the CGS units for magnetic fields. The Gauss G, um, the, the Gauss is related to the, the Tesla through this convention. Convection, con conversion, sorry. 
conventional laboratory magnets can produce magnetic fields as, as, uh, as large as about 25,000 Gauss or 2.5 Tesla. Superconducting magnets that can generate magnetic fields as great as three to the fifth Gauss or 30 Tesla have been constructed. These values can be compared with a small value of Earth's magnetic field near its surface, which is only about half a Gauss or 0 0.5 times 10 to the 24th Tesla. From the equation for the force as a moving charge particle in a magnetic field, you can see that the force has its maximum value when the particle motion is perpendicular to the magnetic field corresponding to theta equals 90 degrees. So that sine theta equals one. The magnitude of this maximum force has a value shown here. You can see that F is zero when V is parallel to B. So no magnetic field is exerted on a charged particle when it moves in the direction of the magnetic field or opposite the field. Okay, in this figure, um, in A, we have the, the direction of the magnetic force F acting on a charged particle moving with a velocity V in the presence of a magnetic field B. So this is um, focusing on the left two figures. And then on the B portion there, a magnetic force on, on, opposite, on positive and negative charges. The dashed lines show the paths of the particles, which are investigated in a, in a later section. Then the other figure, we have on the right, we have the, the right-hand rule number one for de determining the direction of the magnetic force on a positive charge moving with velocity V and a magnetic field B. Experiments show that the direction of the magnetic force is always perpendicular to both B, to both V and B. V is in Victor, B is in Bravo for uh, Positively charged particle is shown in the left and middle figures. To determine the, the direction of the force, we employ the right hand rule um, number one. Point the finger of your right hand in the direction of the velocity. Curl your, the, the fingers in the direction of the magnetic field moving through the smallest angle as shown in the figure on the right. And then three, your thumb is now pointing the direction of the magnetic force exerted on the positive charge. And we can see that right here. Okay, um, let's do the, this um, question here. Um, a charged particle moves in a straight line through a region of space. Which of the following answer must be true? And the answer for this, it has a zero component perpendicular to the particle's velocity. So the, the force that a magnetic field exerts on a charged particle moving through, it is given by F equals QVB sine theta, which is equal to QVB in the perpendicular direction, where, where B in the perpendicular direction is the component of the field perpendicular to the particle's velocity. Since the particle moves in a straight line, the magnetic force must be zero. Here's another one. The North Pole end of a bar magnet is held near a stationary position charged piece of plastic. And the plastic, in this case, is unaffected by the magnet by the magnet. The magnetic force exerted by the magnetic field on a, on a charge is proportional to the charge velocity um, relative to the field. If a charge is stationary, as in this situation, there is no magnetic force. Okay, in this figure, we're showing um, when the velocity of a charged particle is perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field, the particle moves in a circular, in a, in a plane perpendicular to B, which is directed into the page. Let's consider the case of a positively charged particle moving in a uniform magnetic field so that the direction of the particle's velocity is perpendicular to the field, as in the figure here. The label B in and the, and the, the cross crosses tell us that B is directed into the page. Let's apply the right-hand rule to the part particle in the bottom of the figure, the direction of the magnetic force there is upward. The force causes 
the particle to change its direction to follow a curved path. If you apply the right hand rule to the particle at the other points on the circle, you can see that the magnetic force is always directed towards the center of the circular path. So the magnetic force causes a centripetal acceleration, which charges only the, the direction of V and not its magnet, changes only the, the direction of V and not its magnitude. Because F produces a centripetal acceleration, we can equate its magnitude QVB in this case to the mass of the particle multiplied by the centripetal acceleration V squared over R. We can use Newton's second law to write the equation as we're showing here. We can then solve for R. This equation says that the radius of the path is proportional to the momentum MV of the particle and is inversely proportional to the charge in the magnetic field. This equation is often called the cyclotronic equation because it's used in the design of these instruments. So in this figure, we have a, a charged particle having a velocity directed at an angle with a uniform magnetic field moving in a helical path. If the initial direction of the velocity of the charged particle is not perpendicular to the magnetic field, as shown in the figure here, the path followed by the particle is a spiral called a helix along the magnetic field lines. Here's another question. As a charged particle moves freely in a circular path in the presence of a constant magnetic field applied perpendicular to the particle's velocity, the particle's kinetic energy, and the answer is remains constant. The magnetic force acting on the particle is always perpendicular to the velocity of the particle and hence to the displacement the particle is undergoing. Under these conditions, the force does no work on the particle and the particle's kinetic energy remains constant. Okay, let's take a minute to, um, to talk about notation. If B is directed into the page, as in the figure on the left, we use a series of green crosses representing the tail of arrows. If B is directed out of the page, as in the figure on the right, we use a series of green dots representing the, the, the tips of the arrow. If B lies in the plane of the page, we use a series of green, green field lines with, with arrowheads. So that's just something to, to, to have you remember for convention's sake. So here we have an apparatus that demonstrates the, demonstrates the force on a current carrying conductor in an electrical, electrical external magnetic field. Why does a bar switch towards the magnetic? No, why does the bar swing towards a magnet after the switch is closed? If a magnetic field exerts a force on a single charged particle when it moves through a magnetic field, you might expect that the magnetic forces are exerted on a current carrying wire as well, which is, is the case. This is shown in the photo. Because the current is a collection of many charged particles in motion, the resultant force on the wire is due to the sum of the individual forces on the charged particles. The force on the particles is transmitted to the bulk of the wire through collisions and the atoms making up the wire. In this figure, we're showing a segment of a flexible vertical wire partially stretched be between the, the poles of, of, of magnet with the field directed into the page. We can demonstrate the, the force on a current carrying conductor by hanging a wire between poles of a magnet as shown in the figure. In this figure, the magnetic field is directed into the page and covers a region within the, the shaded area. This wire deflects to the right or left when it carries a current. So in this figure, we have a selection of a wire containing moving charges in an external magnetic field B. So we can quantify our discussion. Consider the figure which shows a straight segment of wire of length L in cross-sectional area A carrying a current I in a uniform external magnetic field B. Let's assume that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the wire and is directed into the screen. The force is exerted on each charge carrier in the wire where VD is the drift velocity of the charge. To find the total force on the wire, we multiply the force on one charge 
carrier by the number of, of carriers in the segment. Because the volume of the segment is AL, the number of carriers is NAL, where N is the number of carriers per unit volume. That means that the magnitude of the total magnetic force on the wire of length L is a force on each charge carrier times the total number of carriers. In this figure group, we're showing a, a, a wire carrying a current I in the presence of an external magnetic field B that makes an angle theta with a wire. The magnetic force vector comes out of the page. Recall that the current in the wire is given by the expression shown here. This means that we can write the, the, the maximum force as shown. This equation can be used only when the current and the magnetic field are at right angles to each other. If the wire is not perpendicular to the field, but is at some arbitrary angle, as in the figure, the magnetic magnitude of the mag, magnetic force on the wire is given here where theta is the angle between B and the, the direction of the current. The direction of the force can be obtained by the use of right hand rule number one. In this case, you must place your fingers in the direction of the positive current I rather than in the direction of V before curling them in the direction of B. The thumb then points in the direction of the force as before. The current naturally is made of charges moving at some velocity, so this really isn't a, a separate rule. In this figure, the direction of the magnetic force and the wire is out of the page. And if the current is, is either in the direction of the field or opposite direction of the field, the magnetic force on the wire is zero. So in this figure, we're, we're showing a diagram of a loudspeaker. Most speak, speakers and sound system work by exploiting the magnetic force acting on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. Take a look at the figure of a typical loudspeaker here, which consists of a coil of a wire called a voice coil, a flex, flexible paper cone, and a permanent magnet. The cone of the wire surrounding the, the north pole of the magnet is shaped so that the magnetic field lines are directed radially outward from the coil axis where an electric signal is sent to the coil. It produces a current in the coil, magnetic force to the left ax on the coil. You can test this by applying right-hand rule number one to each turn of the wire. When the current reverses direction as would for a current that varies sinusoidally, the magnitude force in the coil also reverses direction and the cone, which is attached to the coil, accelerates to the right. An alternating current through the coil causes an alternating force on the coil, which results in vibrations of the cone. The vibrating cone creates sound waves as it pushes and pulls on the air in front of it. In this way, a one kilohertz electrical signal is converted to a one kilohertz sound wave. So in this figure, we have a simple electromagnetic pump that has no moving parts that might damage a conducting fluid such as blood passing through it. Applications of right hand number one shows that the, the force in the current carrying segment of the fluid is in the direction of the velocity. So in this figure, what we're trying to look at is the electromagnetic pump. pump. Artificial hearts require a pump to keep the blood flowing and kidney dialysis machines are required to pump to, to assist the heart in pumping blood that is to be cleansed. Ordinary mechanical pumps create problems because they damage the blood cells as they, they move through the pump. The mechanism shown in the figure has demonstrated some promise in applications such as these. A magnetic field is established across a segment of the tube containing the blood flowing in the direction of the velocity V. An electric current passes through the fluid in the direction shown has a magnetic force acting on it in the direction V as you can see by applying the right-hand rule. The force helps to keep the blood in motion. So here um, in the, the finger, the, the top view of the rectangular loop in a uniform magnet field, where we're seeing that on um, here in, in A. And then for B, we have an edge view of the rectangular loop in part A. So let's think about what happens when a loop of current is placed in a magnetic field. 
Consider the figure on the left, which shows a rectangular loop carrying a current I in the presence of an external uniform magnetic field in the plane of the loop. The forces on the sides of the length A are zero because these wires are parallel to the field. The magnitudes of the, the magnetic forces on the sides of length B given in the equation here. The direction of F1, the force on the left side of the loop is out of the screen and F2, the force on the right side of the loop is into the screen. Now let's look at the, the figure on the right where we can see the loop from the side. The forces are directed as shown. Let's assume the loop is pivoted so that it can rotate about point O. You can see that these two forces produce a torque uh, about O that rotates of the loop clockwise. The magnitude of the torque T ma tau max is given by the equation, where the, the moment arm about O is A over two for both forces. Because the area of the loop is A, the maximum torque can be expressed as shown here. The result is valid only when the magnetic field is parallel to the plane of the loop, as we're seeing it in, on the figure on the right. So here um, in the figure, we have an edge view of the loop in part um, A with, a, the, normal to, with a, the normal to the loop of angle theta with respect to the magnetic field. If the field makes an angle theta with a line perpendicular to the plane of the loop, as in the figure here, the, the moment arm for each force is given by the expression shown. It, if we followed a similar analysis to the previous slide, we will get the expression for the magnitude of the torque. This result shows that the torque has the maximum value B over A when the field is parallel to the plane of the loop, that is theta equals 90 degrees, and is zero when the field is perpendicular to the plane of the loop, theta equals zero. As you can see in the figure where the loop tends to, to rotate, to the smaller values of theta so that the, the normal to the plane of the, of the loop rotates towards the direction of the magnetic field. Even though our analysis was for a rectangular loop, a more general de derivation will show that our results applies regardless of the shape of the loop. So here's a question, a square and a circular loop with the same area lie in the xy plane where there's a uniform magnetic field pointing at some angle Q with respect to the positive Z direction. Each loop carries the same current in the same direction. Which magnetic torque is larger? And the answer is the torques are the same. It's hard to imagine life without electric motors. Motors are used in computer disk drives, CD players, DVD players, food processors and blenders, car starters, furnaces, air conditioners, et cetera, et cetera. The motors convert electrical energy to kinetic energy of rotation and, and consists of a rigid current, current carrying loop that rotates when placed in the magnetic field. As we have just seen, the torque on the loop in the, the figure rotates the loop to smaller values of theta until the torque becomes zero. When the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the loop and theta equals zero, if the loop turns past this angle and the current remains in the direction shown in the figure, the, the torque reverses direction and turns the loop in the opposite direction, that is counterclockwise. Here is just a simplified sketch of a DC electric motor. In order to provide continuous rotation in one direction, the current of the loop must periodically reverse direction. In alternating current motors, the, this reversal occurs naturally 100 times a second, 100 times each second. In direct current DC motors, the reversal is accomplished mechanically with split rings contact called communicators and brushes, as you can see in this figure. Although actual motors contain many current loops and uh, communicators, for simplicity, our figure shows only a single loop and a single set of split ring contacts rigidly attached to and rotating with the loop. Electrical stationary contacts called brushes are, are maintained in electrical contact with the rotating split ring. These brushes are usually made of graphite because it is good electrical conductor as well as a good lubricant. 
just when the, the loops become perpendicular to the magnetic field and the torque becomes zero, it, it, inertial, inertia carries the loop forward to the clockwise direction, the brushes cross the, the gaps to the ring, causing the loop current to reverse its direction. This reversal provides another pulse of torque to the clockwise direction for another 180 degrees of the, the current reverses and the process repeats itself. Here we're showing a picture of the engine compartment of a, a Toyota Prius, which is a hybrid vehicle. And this is a modern motor to power a hybrid gas electric car. Here in the figure, we have a we have compasses sh show the effect of the current in a nearby wire. During a lecture demonstration in 1819, uh, Danish scientist um, Hans Orsted found an electric current in a wire deflected a nearby compass needle. This momentous discovery linked a magnetic field with the electric current for the first time. In 1820, Orsted did an experiment similar to the one shown in the figure. As you can see, several compass needles are placed in a horizontal plane near a long vertical wire. Where there's no curtain in, in the wire, as shown in figure on the left, all needles point in the same direction, that is Earth's field. As one would expect, when the wire carries a strong steady current, as shown in the figure on the right, the needles are all deflected in a direction tangent to the circle. So in this figure, um, we using the right hand rule number two for to determine the direction of the magnetic field during due to a long straight wire carrying a current. Um, you can see how that orientation is. Note that the magnetic field lines form circular circles around the wire. And in B, we have um, a circular magnetic field line surrounding a current carrying wire displayed by iron, iron fillings. To determine the direction of the field, we need a second right-hand rule, the right-hand rule number two. So we point the thumb of your right hand along a wire in the direction of a positive current, as in the figure on the left. Your fingers then naturally curl, curl in the direction of the magnetic field. When the current is reversed, the fi filings in the, in the figure on the right also reverse. Because the filings point in the direction of B, we can conclude that the lines of B form circular circles about the wire. By symmetry, the magnitude of B is the same everywhere on a circular path centered on the wire and lying in a plane perpendicular to the wire. By varying the current and, and distance from the wire, it can be experimentally determined that B is proportional to the current and inversely proportional to the distance from the wire. These observations leads to a mathematical expression for the strength of a magnetic field due to the current, I, in a long straight wire. The proportionality constant um, mu zero is called the permittivity of free space. Um, in the figure here, we have a closed circular path of radius r around a long straight current carrying wire is used to calculate the magnetic field set up by the wire. Let's use Ampere's law to, to derive the magnetic field due to a long straight wire carrying a current i. As we discussed earlier, each of the magnetic field lines of the, the configuration form a circle with the wire at its center. The magnetic field is tangent to the circle at every point in, and its magnitude has the same value B over the entire circumference of the circle of radius R. So B parallel equals B, um, as you can see in the figure. Note that B parallel can be removed from the, the sum. Our equation then gives us the equation shown here. Let's do, do, divide both sides by the circumference. This is a result we would expect. The magnetic field due to the current is a, in a long straight wire. <clears throat> Note that Ampere's law in this form is valid only when the currents and fields don't change with time. So in this figure, we have two parallel wire, wires oriented vertically, um, car carry steady currents and exert force on each other. The force is attractive if the currents have the same direction as shown and repulsive if the two currents have opposite directions. 
As we have seen, a magnetic force acts on a current carrying conductor when the conductor is placed in an external magnetic field. Because a conductor car carrying a current creates a magnetic field around itself, it's easy to understand that two current carrying wires placed close together exert magnetic forces on each other. We can consider a long straight parallel wire separated by a distance d and carrying currents I1 and I2 in the same direction as shown in the figure. Wire one is directly above wire two. That's a magnetic force on one wire due to the magnetic field set up by the other wire. In this cal cal calculation, we are finding the, the force on wire one due to the magnetic field of wire two. The, the current I2 sets up magnetic field B2 at wire one. The direction of B2 is perpendicular to the wire, as one can see in the figure. We can then calculate the, the magnitude of the magnetic field. Remember that the mag magnitude of the magnetic force in wire one in the presence of B2 due to, to I2 is the equation here um, we're showing. We can substitute our expression for, for B2H, which we can rewrite um, and we're, we're showing the, the result. The direction of F1 is downward toward wire two, as we can determine by, by using right-hand rule number one. The calculation is completely symmetric, which means that the force F2 on wire two is equal to an opposite F1 as ex expected from Newton's third law of action reaction. So here's a couple of definitions. And so um, we have the definition of ampere, the definition of a coulomb. Um, we have shown that parallel conductors carrying currents in the same direction attract each other. We can use this same procedure to show that parallel conductors carrying cur currents in opposite directions repel each other. The forces between two, par two parallel wires carrying a current is used to find the SI unit of current, the ampere. If two long parallel wires one meter apart carrying the same current and the magnitude force per unit length on each wire is two times 10 to the minus seven newtons per meter, the current is defined to be one amp. We can now define the SI unit of charge, a coulomb, in terms of the ampere. If, if a conductor carrying a steady current of one amp the, the quantity of charge that flows through any cross section in one second is one coulomb. Okay, um, for a th think and learn question, which of the following actions would double the, the magnitude of the magnetic force per unit length between two parallel current carrying wires? And we want to be choosing all that are correct. And the answer is A and C. And so um, keep that in mind. You can look that up in the text. We're going to, I'm going to go quickly through these um, assess to, to learn. And so I'll just um, read them and then give the, the answers and you can be thinking about them. So in the figure below, I1 equals two a and I2 equals 6A, which of the following is true? And the answer is F1 is equal to F2. Um, for the figure on the left, all segments of the current loop produced in the magnetic field at the, the center of the loop direct, directed upwards and, and the figure, two figures on, on the right. For A, the magnetic field lines for a circular loop, note that the lines resemble those of a bar magnet, and B, the magnetic field of a bar magnet is similar to that of a current loop. So we can think about how to increase the strength of a magnetic field due to a current carrying wire. One way is to form the, the wire into a loop. Um, you consider the effect of several small segments of the, the current loop as shown in the figure on the left, the small segment at the bottom of the loop labeled delta X1 um, produces a magnetic field of displacement B, of magnitude B1 in the loop center directed upward. We can verify the, the direction of B by using the right hand rule number two for a long straight wire. Imagine holding the wire with your right hand, with your current thumb pointing in the direction of the current, your finger then curls around in the direction of B. 
Note that the segment of length delta x2 at the top of the loop also contributes to the field in the center, which increases its strength. The field produces at the center of the segment delta x2 has, has the, the same magnitude as B1 and is also directed upward. In the same way, all other segments that these, like these contribute to the field. The net effect is a magnetic field for the, the current loop as shown in the middle figure. Notice that the, the magnetic field lines enter at the bottom of the loop and exit at the top. Compare this figure with the figure on the far right, which shows that the field of a barred magnet the two fields are similar. One side of the loop acts as though it were the north pole of a magnet and the other acts as if it was in the south pole. So here we're showing the, the field of a circular loop carrying current I, which can be approximated by the field due to four straight wires each carrying current I. Um, And you can see the, the derivation of the equations to that result from, from this. Um, I'm just gonna go quickly over this. Um, so each one of these sections, we're introducing the equations that are derived for these different types of magnetic fields um, established in different scenarios. Here, we're showing the magnetic field lines for a loosely wound solenoid. Um, Figure shows the magnetic field lines of loosely wound solenoid about length L and the total number of turns N. Notice that the field lines inside the solenoid are nearly parallel, uniformly spaced and close together. As a result, the fields inside the solenoid are strong and approximately uniform. The exterior field at the sides of the solenoid is non-uniform, much weaker than the interior field and opposite direction to the field inside the solenoid. Continue with the solenoid. If the turns are closely spaced, the, the field lines are shown in the figure on the left, entering at one end of the solenoid and merging at the other. One of the solenoid acts as a north pole and the other end acts as a south pole. We can take a look at the figure which shows an old style cathode ray TV set, the, the, the type of TV uses steering magnets that rapidly and accurately direct an electron beam across a stream of phosphorus um, in, a, in a scanning motion, creating an illusion of moving pictures out of a series of bright dots. Here we have an electron microscope, which uses a similar gun and, and both electrostatic and electromagnetic lenses to focus the beam. We, we show this on the cover, and here is a particle um, accelerator that requires very large electromagnets to, to turn particles moving at nearly the speed of light. Um, so this is an example of an experimental device that is used in fusion power research, and they use magnetic fields to contain hot plasmas. Um, let's use Ampere's law to obtain the expression for the magnetic field inside a solenoid carrying current I across section A, a cross section taken along the, the length of part of the solenoid as shown in the figure. B so inside the solenoid is uniform and parallel to the axis, and B outside is approximately zero. We can see that the equation that we've um, derived for, for this kind of a scenario here. For magnetic domains, um, we can think about the source of a magnetic field. We know a single coil like that in the figure has a north pole and a south pole, but if that is true for a coil or wire, it should also be true for a current confined in a circular path. In particular, an individual atom should act as a magnetic magnet because of the motion of the electrons about the nucleus. So we, we know some of the details of what's going on for a, a single um, electron. Um, and so we're deriving an equation here um, to give us a perspective. And um, each electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Um, 
circles the, the atom once in about 10 to minus 16 seconds. If we divide the electric field by the time interval, we see that the orbiting electron is equivalent to a current of 1.6 times 10 to the minus three amps. So here we have a classical model of a spinning electron. Um, the magnetic properties of many materials can be explained by the fact that an electron not only circles in an orbit, but also spins on its axis like a, a top with a spin magnetic moment as shown in the figure. Note that this classical description should not be taken too literally. The properties of elect electron spin can be understood only in the context of quantum mechanics. And that's going to be something that will be talked about in a later topic. Um, here we're considering the orientation of magnetic dipoles before and after a magnetic field is applied. In certain strong magnetic materials, for example, iron, cobalt, nickel, the magnetic fields produced by an electron spin doesn't cancel completely. We, we call these ferromagnetic materials. In ferromagnetic materials, strong coupling occurs between the neighboring atoms forming large groups of atoms with spins that are aligned called domains. The sizes of these groups are typically at ranges from about 10 to the minus fourths um, centimeters to um, a tenth of a centimeter. In an unmagnetized mag subject, the domains are randomly oriented. When an external field is applied, they, they, they start to form an alignment. Um, in what we call hard magnetic material domains remain aligned even after the external field is removed. The result is a permanent magnet. And soft magnetic material such as iron, once the external field is removed, thermal agitation produces motion of the domains and the material quickly returns to an unmagnetized self. Here we're just seeing an example. Um, of a, a permanent magnet temporarily magnetizes um, some paper clips, which then cling to each other through the magnetic force. Um, for diamagnetism, a frog is levitated in a, in a 16 Tesla magnetic field. Um, and the, the levitation force is exerted on the diamagnetic magnetic water molecules in the frog's body. The frog suffers no ill effects from the, the levitation experience. And another concept, paramagnetic materials have also have magnetic moments that tend to align with an externally applied magnetic field, but the response is extremely weak compared with that of ferromagnetic materials. Ex examples of paramagnetic substances are aluminum, calcium, and, and platinum. Okay, um, we had the, the first one, we talked about these assessed to learn. We now have the, the remainder of these. So I'll just quickly go through these and then um, get to the, the summary. So for this, um, what is the second question? Um, a certain region of space that is uniform, in a uniform magnetic field pointing the positive Z direction, in what direction should a negative point charge move to experience a force in the positive X direction? And the answer is in the negative Y direction, minus Y. In each of the following situations, point charge Q moves in a uniform magnetic field B. The strength of the magnetic field is indicated by the density of field lines. In each situation, the initial speed V of the charge is the same. For which situations will the charge Q travel the, the longest distance in a certain time T? And the answers that are true for this is one, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. So it would be option nine. Um, so for this one, um, for the charge that has a, the largest displacement in a certain time t, the answer is number five. Um, so we're seeing that. A bar magnet moving with speed v passes 
below a stationary charge Q. What can be said about the magnitude of the magnetic force on, on the bar magnet and on the charge? Um, the answer is F bar and F Q are both non-zero. Two identical bar magnets are placed rigidly and anti-parallel to each other as shown. At what location, if any, is the net magnetic field close to zero? And the answer is C only. The charge particle moves into a region containing both an electric field and a magnetic field. Which of the, of the statements below is or are true? And the answer is only C. Charge is released from rest in E and B fields. Both fields point along the X axis. Which of the following statements regarding the charge motions are correct? And the answer is one and two only. Charge has an initial velocity parallel to the minus Y to the to the Y axis in E and B fields. Both fields are pointing along the, the x-axis. Which of the following statements regarding the charge motions are correct? And the answer is the charge will travel in a helical path of increasing pitch. For this one, consider a long, thin, straight wire with a current I. Which of the following statements about the magnetic field lines is true? And the answer is B and D only. A very long wire lies in a plane with a short wire segment. The long wire carries current I, while the short wire of length L carries current I, little i. The two wires are parallel to each other. Which of the following statements are true? And the answer is B and C. In all cases, the wire sh shown carries a current I. For which situation is the magnitude of the magnetic field maxima at point P? And the answer is number four. Order the following situations according to the magnitude of the magnetic field at point P. Order from highest to lowest. And the answer to this is um, none, of the, none of the above. The diagram shows a circular wire loop of radius R carrying current I. What is the direction of the magnet magnetic field B at the center of the loop? And the answer is up. The diagram shows a circular wire loop of radius R carrying current I. What is the magnitude of the magnetic field B at the center of the loop? And the answer is mu naught I over 2R mu i naught over 2r, number five. Okay, those are a lot of questions. Um, now we'll just have a, several pages of summaries and I'll try and focus on this and help you to review the material. So for magnetic fields, a magnetic force that acts on a charge Q moving with velocity V and a magnetic field B has magnitude given here where theta is the angle between V and B. To find the direction of the force, we use right hand rule number one. Um, point the fingers of your open right hand in the direction of V and then curl them in the direction of B. Your thumb then points in the direction of the magnetic force F. If the char charge is negative rather than the positive, the force is directed in the, the op opposite the, the force given by the right hand rule. The SI units of the magnetic field is the Tesla or Weber per square meter. An additional commonly used unit for magnetic field is the Gauss. Field um, motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. The charged particle moving in a uniform magnetic field so that its initial velocity is perpendicular to the field. It will move in a circular path in a plane per, um, perpendicular to the magnetic field. The radius R, uh, of the, the circular path can be found from Newton's second law in centripetal acceleration and is given by the equation shown where M is the mass of the particle and Q is its charge. Okay, we talked about a couple of different scenarios. And so here is um, number one, a magnetic force on a current carrying conductor. If a straight conductor of length L 
carries current I, the magnet, magnetic force on the conductor when it is placed in a uniform uh, external magnetic field B is given here, where theta is the angle between the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. The right hand rule number one also gives the direction of the magnetic force in the conductor. In this case, however, you must point your finger in the direction of the current rather than the direction of V. For magnetic torque, the, the, the torque on a current carrying loop of wire in a magnetic field B has mag magnitude given here, where I is a current in the loop and A is a cross sectional area. The magnitude of the magnetic moment of a current carrying coil is defined by mu, where n is the number of loops. The magnetic moment is considered a vector that is perpendicular to the plane of the loop. The angle between b and mu is, is theta. For magnetic fields of a current loops and solenoids, uh, the magnetic field at the, the center of a coil of n circular loops of radius r, each carrying current i, is given in the equation shown. The magnetic field inside a solenoid has a magnitude given here, where n is the number of turns of, of wire per unit length. For Ampere's law, the, the, the magnetic field at distance r from a long straight wire carrying current i has a magnitude shown here, where mu naught the permeability of free space is the permeability of free space that the magnetic field lines around a long straight wire are circle or circles concentric with the wire. Ampere's law can be used to find the magnetic field around certain simple cur current carrying conductors. It can be written as shown where B is parallel in. in where B parallel is the component of B tangential to a small current element of length delta L that is part of a closed path and I is a total current that uh, penetrates the, the closed path. For magnetic forces between two parallel conductors, a force per unit length on each of two parallel wires separated by a distance D and carrying currents I1 and I2 has a magnetic magnitude shown. The forces are attractive if their currents are opposite in the same direction or repulsive if they are in the opposite direction. Okay, well, thank you very much. That will end our lecture.